Well, you guys, I mean, considering everything, I mean, you kind of regroup pretty quickly in terms of, you know, calendar years because your first record as a duo uh, was just out in 87. Um, we got that deal with Columbia. Um, how did how did you pull that off? Well, that was that was us licking our wounds with Bobby Z. Yeah, we just like um, luckily um, there was a lot of interest and curiosity about us from record companies. So there was a lot of like here have all this money take this money you know and, and that was scary and we understood enough um at least almost enough back then that that money you need to pay back you can't just like thanks for the money we um so we kind of understood you know and we took some money and we started we went in the studio and and just started writing uh, with bobby and we had some songs already written uh, and then there was just like this bidding war. Um, we had a song we wrote with Bobby called Waterfall, and that was the big, like, that's their single. It's going to be a hit. Oh, we'll pay, we'll pay you 600000 We'll pay you 700 We'll pay you a million dollars. You know, it's just like, this is crazy. Well, this adds is a little pressure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, nothing happened. <laughs> you guys, you had the video too. I remember. Yeah, that's right. So, did the record turn out how you guys had hoped it might? And how did you decide sort of what flavor you would go with for your sound? Um, we didn't decide. We did. We were young and completely like what do you call that we were functioning completely in earnest you know like and each song was just a, there's different style you know there's like this is the life which is like acoustic guitar and piano and ballad total folk song and then there's what was it called white with Tom Scott playing Lyricon, and it's all jazzy, like fusion kind of weird. I don't even know what to call it. You know, and then there's like Honeymoon Express, which is total like funky pop song. So we, you know, it did come out the way we expected, I think. We thought it would be a, a whole mix of stuff. Um, and we, you know, what I regret is that there were certain songs that we did that we were trying to write a commercial song, and they're just like bad songs, like Sideshow. <laughs> so you felt like because of that, it was a little forced. Yeah. Yeah. Not organic. Yeah. 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 So that's what happens, you know. When you're young and, and also when there's like this, when the industry goes crazy and talks to you in an unrealistic manner, <laughs> which is exactly what they do, and then you buy it all and then you're screwed. You guys got on Soul Train for, for that one, didn't you? Yeah, we, <laughs> yeah. That's right. We, I think we played Honeymoon Express on Soul Train. That was one of the highlights of my life. <laughs> to Don Cornelius. Rah, 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 rah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was cool. Or maybe it was Are You My Baby? It was Fruit at the Bottom. Oh, it was that record. Goes the next one? Yeah, I think so. Were you um, consciously thinking? Um, let's throw in something here that kind of has a revolution flavor or let's not do that because we want to have our own identity or did you kind of have a little bit of that tug of war? Yeah. Um, it, it was a little difficult because like we gave so much of our sound 
to the revolution. You know, I mean, if you could, you know, sometimes it snows in April and the life are, are that sounds like the same style. That sounds like the same artist kind of to me, you know? So sometimes we were like, just forget it. We just have to be who we are. And, and then people will know what we gave him. And so we'd have that side and then, but then we'd have the other side, like, no, it's a, People expect us to be, you know, just another, another prince, another version of prince, and we're not. And we're so we're gonna, you know, do this weird track with, I don't know, samples in it. You know, I don't know. So yeah, we we. It was an indecisive. Kind of, nobody, we didn't win the argument either way. <laughs> well, to me, I thought fruit the bottom was a little funkier overall than the first one. Yeah. Yeah, well, we did have um, record company people that like, you know, in different departments saying, well, I'll take, you know, I'll take them. I, I like them. Can you make like a more funky kind of record? And, and okay. So, you know, we did sort of try to, after the first album was such a weird trip with categories and, you know, radio stations and all that stuff. Um, we had a guy at Columbia that uh, championed us for a minute there and was like, thought he knew what to do and then give me some little funky things. And so we did a little lolly lolly and are you my baby? And you know, a little more funky kind of stuff. Um, but then it was still like, we were wearing like baggy pants. I, like we did the video to are you my baby? and. I think you can see it now. Wendy's wearing baggy jeans that are like down. And that was before everyone was wearing baggy pants. And we were saying, no, baggy pants are coming. That's going to be the thing. And there was literally a, a guy from the record company there saying, looking at our wardrobe, like going literally hands on. Like, why can't you wear this? You know, and it was like, but we fought and wore what we wanted to wear. and But because of that, you know, there was like this disconnect and they wanted us to wear fur coats and be in a limousine, you know, and have this whole image of, I don't know, glam, glamorous. Yeah, they diff you were definitely a, a programming challenge. Yeah. Format <laughs> challenge. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wonder, you know, if you guys had been around in the 60s or 70s, if you would have found a different, you know, because it wasn't as, the industry wasn't as, you know, segmented uh, back then. Yeah. And that's what I grew up with. So to me, that's normal to have a kind of a mixture and to put on an album and discover each track, you know, it's not the same song over and over again. Like, um, so I still, you know, <laughs> still can't be kept in the chicken coop too very well. <laughs> did Did you guys play many live shows um, from the first two records? Um, we did. Yeah, we had a, a really good band um, with um, Carla Azar was our drummer. Who she's now in Auto Lux and she plays with Jack White and she's this really cool drama girl and um chris bruce played guitar with us and he's he now plays a lot with um and he produced michelle and Deggio cello's last record and he works with her and um, our bass player alan kamai who is now a police officer good to have friends at the top <laughs> <laughs> especially if it's out in your area yeah <laughs> So yeah, we, we had a really good band and we, we did some gigs in the States, just, you know, kind of major cities. And, and then we, we, did, we did Europe and did pretty well over there and um, had a good time. A couple of little tours. And that's about it. Did, did you um, go out with any big, names um 
hoping for them or anything no. like that? No, we never did anything like that. Um, we played fest, you know, some European festivals and stuff like that, which was really fun. But no, we were just like playing, uh, playing smaller venues um, just on our own. So I don't know. Did you um, do any Revolution Prince covers at your shows or stayed away from that? Um, I don't think we did. We did Mountains because that was, I mean, I've been playing that on the piano since I was 13. So it's like, that's mine. It's mine. <laughs> wow. It really goes back that far? Yeah. It was just something, I, a groove I played on the piano when I was a kid. Yeah, so it's just in my body. It's part of my bod. But I, was, I wasn't doing that 22-minute version of Mountains. <laughs> hey, that was just another day at the factory. <laughs> Everything was long. The, like, uh, you have no idea. Rehearsals were like, we were a loop machine. We were just a, a looper machine. We were Ableton, just like, okay, Lisa, loop that part. Oh, okay. Uh, two hours, three hours go by. Prince is working on it, flipping the microphone trick or something. <laughs> so you guys moved to Virgin Records eventually, and um, did that change much? for you in terms of um i don't know support or what you're able to do or um no i mean it it was nice that we were then on the same label worldwide um because it was weird we were we had a split deal and that was kind of diff difficult and maybe part of the reason why things didn't connect um very well but but then I, I I still think it was just um, we just we weren't and by the time we were on Virgin um, we did a Roica and that was like um, again like didn't fit into any category and it wasn't quite like soon after that came out i think cheryl crow started happening you know and it was a similar-ish sound and but we weren't quite that and then but also what was the other there were a couple other bands that came out and was like uh we're not quite that either you know so and then we were getting interested in in other things and scoring and, you know, we got a little disillusioned with the whole record business. Just, ew, leave us alone now. Yeah. How, how did you, what was your like entree into uh, scoring? Um, it happened accidentally. We. We were working with Seal, actually. Um, we met Seal at a basketball game here in LA at a Clippers game. And um, we had heard that his song, Crazy, and it, um, whatever. So we met and we were like, oh, I love your song. We should get together. So we met Trevor Horn through Seal. And so we started producing Seal and working with Trevor and then a film company came to Trevor Horn for a song for the movie Dangerous Minds. And funny enough, the song that they ended up liking was This Is The Life, which was the ballad on our first record. <laughs> and Michelle Pfeiffer heard it and really loved it and was like, this has to be in the movie. And so they started using it in the movie. and. Mark Isham, the composer, was composing the score at the time, and the producers didn't like the score. So they called us in, and 
they knew that we were like from Prince's band and they were like, uh, you know, the composer took all the dick out of the movie. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, well, no problem, sir. We've got big dicks. And they're like, you're hired. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we actually uh, went to Mark Isham's house at first, they tried to like, maybe if you work with the composer and you can like funk it up or something. And and that, that was just insulting to Mark really. He was tremendous and I, I think he's a great composer and he was so generous with us. And he just he gave us the film basically. He said, you guys can do this, you know, you should just do it. And so we did it and that was our first film. Dangerous mind. <laughs> yeah, I saw that in the theater. Or I saw screaming maybe, but yeah, I remember that. Um, I didn't know at the time though that you guys had done the music. Yeah. Subsequent subsequently. Um yeah. Um so and you got into TV doing a lot of TV shows and um, yeah. yeah. So how does that process differ from just making records? Well, one thing that I really needed from it that I get was not being constrained by style. When you're scoring, you can you can invent the style. You can do you can play with sounds. You can um, you know depending on what the the show is or what the director or producers will tolerate. <laughs> You know, but you can, you know, you don't have to worry about what, what's in the top 10, you know, it's just a creative process that has to do with sound. So I love that. Um, and you can, you can get very retro or whatever too, and it doesn't, it can work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like this thing we're working on right now. In fact, that um, we're using a lot of synths and, um, arpeggiators and stuff like that and and on the show we were working on just previously when we try to use synths and arpeggiated parts it tugged on the producer's ear and he'd always say what is, that sounds so retro what is that sound <laughs> take it out of there like he just hated synthesizers so, so you just never know but but yeah there's a lot more freedom in it so that that was a welcome uh, change for us and and really a lot of fun because we just were like playing with toys. It was great. Throughout that time, were you guys still, you know, regularly composing more traditional songs or did you kind of take a sabbatical from that too? Um, so songwriting, it, it's still for me, it's a sporadic thing. It doesn't come as, as regular. I can write music all day long but then, but making a song and putting lyrics and, you know, making it a thing, um, it, it's sporadic for me. And um, so I, I kind of go in cycles. So dur during that first part, uh, when we first started getting into scoring, I, I didn't really write that much. But then after, after a while, I, it was like a, uh, a floodgate open and I wrote a whole bunch of songs. <laughs> So it's kind of good to be able to go back and forth and, and take breaks from writing and, you know, having more life and stuff to write about. <laughs> more pain. So will we still see some, some Wendy and Lisa records in the future, you think, or? Yes, we're talking about it right now because we've been doing other things and we've been doing the revolution and touring and and that's brought up a lot of feelings and um you know and but it also took us away from the scoring world so we're, we have to kind of work and schmooze our way back in there like no we didn't leave we're still scoring <laughs> once i get a couple jobs under my belt then i then i think Another record has to happen if the cycle is returning. So, yeah. Well, 
What was it like for you when you got back for the first uh, time with the revolution again? Um, it must have been so emotional. It's, yeah, I can't even, the, it was painful on so many levels. Uh, I mean, not just to do with Prince. I mean, that's just one part of it. That's one person that, and a huge person. And, but then like, like for me coming home, I, I just recently, like I, well, I've lost my brother and my mother. And so coming home was different now. And like, I couldn't share it with my mom and my brother and tell them what happened. And, you know, and so even that was like a new thing I had to learn and it was really painful. And, you know, and the, you know, the thing that keeps us going out there is, is, is the incredible reaction from the fans themselves and how emotional they are because their emotion is the only thing it comes close to what ours is, you know, that these people really loved him. They really did, you know, and, and he was a part of their life and the music that we played and they, they just totally opened their lives and to us and his music. And I mean, that that's stuff of life, man, you know, and so, so to see these people face to face and to be able to walk Prince's talk is a big part of what we're doing and, and what we love about what we're doing. You know, he sang about Paisley Park and, and, and about brothers and sisters and, and about love and, and then he left, <laughs> you know. But we're here and we can still, like, we can actually hug you now. And, there, there was love in it, and there is love in it, and there always will be. So that's what we're doing. Well, and the reunion was talked about so much. I mean, when he was still with us too for so long. Yeah, um, yeah, we really, yeah. A shame it didn't happen. Yeah. Um. So when you guys, I haven't gotten to see one of your shows yet. I've heard some uh, recordings and seen some videos, but um, do you try to stay, how closely do you try to stay to the records uh, versus maybe throwing some wrinkles in like Prince would have probably, you know, done if he was still leading it, so. Yeah, um, we stay pretty true to the arrangements. Um, but we do throw in a couple of things and, and a couple of things that we remembered from uh, live versions of things that we would go into, you know, groove parts. And um, those are the things that we're kind of more excited about doing. Like thing, Prince would have cues that he'd just call out, like, uh, or he'd go like this with his hand. And that was actually a piece of music that we would go and play. You know, so if he was standing over there and he just went, then we go, you know, and it, so there were things like that, or he'd say ice cream and it would go into a, this whole song. And so we'd, we'd kind of do a little, a little bit of that. But, um, but what kind of, when we first started putting, learning the songs and playing them again together. But the people around us were, were just so blown away by how much it sounded like the record. It sounded like the revolution. <laughs> that we just like, let's just be satisfied with, with that, you know, because it was kind of remarkable after 30 years. And it's like, wow, you guys still sound like you guys. <laughs> it's like, because we got this, you know, I got my old keyboards and, or, you know, plugins that sound like them. Or, you know, we really took, uh, made an effort to get as many sounds back as, as we could. So, um, so yeah, so we're pretty true to arrangements people know. 
who's, who's, who's handling lead vocals? Um, well, we do a lot. Of, uh, here's the thing. Um, Wendy, we take a spot during the show, and Wendy makes a statement to the audience about the fact that when we first reunited after Prince's death, the question was, who's going to sing? And what we could come up with and what felt the best and still does, what feels the best is you guys. You guys are going to sing. We're the band. We'll sing our parts. We sing some of the lead. You know, we'll help you along. But it's, it's yours now. It's not to do with somebody coming in and pretending to be Prince and putting on a show. That, that's not what we are doing. We had to heal this occurrence and try to transpose it into our lives now. And so we gave it to each other. Um, having said that, we do have Stokely Williams um, from Mint Condition come, uh, he comes up on a handful of songs and we decided that he was a good choice because he was also a, a Minneapolis boy and Prince thought he was really talented. Prince was like, that Stokely is a talented man, you know? <laughs> and, and that made us feel like, yeah, you know, because Stokely's amazing. I mean, he plays drums and keyboards and guitars, and, you know, he's like Prince in a way. And he's not singing. He doesn't try to imitate. He works with the crowd. He's so personable with the crowd, you know, and he just gets people to put their hands up and, you know, and he's just good because we're busy, you know, we're playing and we can't like really. You know, right. Brown Mark does the best he can and kind of yells at them and stuff. But um, still, we can get out there and, you know, get them dancing a little more and stuff like that. And so that's been a, a great. When you first started doing those shows compared to now, does it still seem like it's as raw or is there sort of like a coming to terms sense of it now? Oh, yeah. It's, it's evolved a lot and yeah in the beginning we could it was hard to get through a show but we were still too emotional you know we would play the show but it was for me yeah you know i know i would stress out during the show or leave my body or you know it wasn't quite there but um now it's it's evolved more and we're we have a good time you know, we, we actually are smiling a lot and, and enjoying it and like just feeling the energy of, of the people. It really gets you going. So, um, and we've just gotten better and looser. I, I mean, our bodies, you know, not so <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't be funky if you're playing like that. So we had to loosen up, you know, and, and, it's better. It's a lot better now. It's not as stressful at all. I could see it being like kind of cathartic and then evolve to being a real sort of tribute. Yeah, it's definitely much more like of a, a celebration, if you want to say, you know, it's more happy, like this is so great. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a high, it's a really good feeling, you know, I mean, there's still you know, we'll play sometimes it snows in April and have tearful moments or, you know, purple rain. It's pretty emotional, but, but you know, we're playing Baby on a Star or I Would Die for You. It's just like, ah, oh, you know, certain songs, it's just beautiful. It must be challenging for Wendy to do all the guitar, you know, when he used to do a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's doing a great job. She had to get all those solos and, um, you know, talk about a tall order. It's like, here, go learn these John Coltrane solos. <laughs> <I'm> like, okay. <laughs> but yeah, she's doing great. And yeah, it's good. Um, so 
you know, when 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 he passed, of course, we we talked last time. It was just such a uh, devastating thing for all of us. But um, I was blown away by the magnitude of tributes that came worldwide. You yeah. know, even though I followed him all these decades and knew he was such a star and he had all these hits, um, it just seemed like at times the mainstream kind of like forgot about him a little bit at certain times and things like that. But then when that happened, I mean, just the outpouring of just love and recognition worldwide was staggering. I agree. I totally agree. Um, that the Eiffel Tower was lit up purple and, you know, the Sydney Opera House. And yeah, I mean, wow, that he was, you know, I don't, I don't think he would have even thought that, you know, for even in his wildest, I'm the shit, you know, I'm the baddest. I think even that, I, cause that, that was spectacular. It really didn't, that, that surprised me too in, in such a beautiful way, you know, but it, there was kind of a sense of like, are you just catching up now <laughs> that he's gone or what? <laughs> you know, like, where was this a minute ago? And I was like, where were you when he was doing his own music club and not selling that many records? And Yeah. <laughs> Suddenly he's worldwide like, oh. Uh, mm. Fickle, fickle, fickle world. Did, did you have any I idea or sense that he was, you know, um, in pain or struggling or going through anything? Could you tell from afar or, or how did you feel about that? Oh, yeah. I, yeah. It started, you know, for a, a, for a couple of years, I would see pictures of him. And he didn't look right, and um, and I didn't see him personally, so I never got a chance to, you know, like, are you okay? <laughs> like, dude, what's up? But I did. I worried when he, uh, when the piano and a microphone tour was announced, I, that really troubled me. I. I I was, he's doing what? Like, why? Why is he doing that? Is that he's saying goodbye? You know, he he's wrapping it up, and I didn't understand why. Like, what was going on with that? And then it was just a few months later, he was gone, and it was. Like it's a hoax. It can't be real. <laughs> yeah. So I felt. Yeah. Yeah, it's just unbelievable. But even right up to the end, he was still doing different things and pushing the envelope. In my opinion, he was still, you know, the third eye girl thing was, you know, different. And um, whether it was as good or reached the same heights, that's very subjective. But. Yeah. Um, you know, he was working with Mono Neon and doing like, you know, stuff with him. And I mean, even at 57, right up to the end, he was still pushing the envelope. I oh, think. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, he just wanted to explore more and more and more. And yeah, what a loss. Yeah. I mean, I, he almost seemed like um, immortal. You know, I mean, he he seemed um, superhuman and just never. But then when you look back at it, you think, man, all that he did in that relatively short time is just astounding. Yeah. The, how, how prodigious. Yeah. yeah. I know. I know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm so proud of him, you know, for... for for all the weirdness and and for the the, the the trouble that he must have been in uh, towards the end, I, I'm still just so wildly proud of him and the way he lived his life. You know that he just really 
was an extremist <laughs> in the best kind of way. And, you know, it was great to be a witness and to be close to that, you know, and, and he, he needed to rest is what he needed. He needed to fucking rest. Knowing him as you knew him, were you surprised when things came up from afar, like, you know, where he went to the symbol thing or where he finally eventually got married and he made himself more accessible and was on all these talk shows and he had became a Jehovah's Witness. And as these things like happened, um, how much did you keep track of that? And did any of that kind of like surprise you? None of it surprised me. No, none of it. I, I and I I would keep track mostly like through Bobby or something. I didn't you know not from the trades or anything like that or Bobby. You know Bobby always knew the scoop. Like what's he doing? How is he? <laughs> you know? um, no, I I just knew. It all made sense to me, you know, and I was like, when I would hear some, he's doing this, I'm like, yeah, of course he is. <laughs> and the whole religion thing, I, you know, that was, you know, he had to really like explore and really dedicate to something, you know, and he, he really, he checked out, a, he read a lot of different religions and Scientology and all kinds of things, you know, and he liked the Jehovah's and that seemed to speak to him. Um, so, you know, it's just funny to think of him, you know, doing his service and you know, going door to door. Knocking, yeah. <laughs> wow. That's a good one. <laughs> funny thing there was, I, I met uh, Larry Graham backstage after a show at the House of Blues in um, Hollywood. And it's like mid nineties. And I said, um, Hey, are you, have you met Prince at all? I mean, are you aware that he's like covering a bunch of your songs now on a regular basis, sly songs, and he's doing, um, you know, um, Grand Central Station songs. And he goes, ah, I have heard that. I haven't met him yet. And then I was like, think within a year, not only have they met, but I mean, they became such a, incredible relationship and he kind of became a spiritual advisor and all that so i know it was amazing it is amazing because prince was such a fan for like as a boy too you know just it's kind of funny i mean i hope it was i hope it was some good love <laughs> <laughs> we needed that lisa as we, as we look back on prince you know what would you say if you're able to do it, was his greatest talent out of out of it at all? Wow, his greatest talent was self discipline. Um, because being a musician myself, I know how much time he put in. You know, just shedding, just he could play, you know, and he worked on it. And and he did it all the time and he didn't have to because he was cute and he was other things and he was this and he was that. And um, he was one of the most creative people I've ever known and that I'll probably ever, ever know. And to have to have that ability and the discipline to do it, to put it into effect is astounding. It's incredible. And over such a long period too. Yeah. Yeah. And keep it interesting, you know. Is there any um, single memory that you have maybe that was something that he did or accomplished that you were just that just kind of blew your mind whether it was i don't know playing something a certain way or a certain song or a certain thing on stage or something yeah, yeah i mean there were there were lots of times on stage you know when he 
either like either a guitar solo that he would just like kill that <laughs> And that I would tear up on stage sometimes, you know. It, I knew this guy was great, you know. I'm playing with this guy right now, and this is, like, great. <laughs> we were all at the top of our game, like, at a certain point, you know. And, yeah, there were even rehearsals sometimes where we were so funky and tight, and Prince was standing there, and... I would just get a lump in my throat, like, this is, like, otherworldly great, <laughs> you know, like, and it would be like a, a loop, like a funk groove thing, you know, and I don't know, it was all, like almost a metaphysical experience because it was this re repetitive groove that we'd be doing, and it was just, like, so passionate and, and funky and you just be like I'm gonna cry oh my god it, it, I, I that happened quite frequently around him <laughs> I'm lucky lucky to have that yeah no um, but it can't but you can feel it too as a listener I mean so it's not yeah. just you know it, it came through um, outside of your little tight knit group, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, in a big in a big way. Um, what, was there anything that you might say was sort of his Achilles heel? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, musically or personally? Uh, just in the way he. I was thinking more personally because I, musically, I don't really, I don't know if he had so much of that musically, but obviously he's a person like all of us and he had his little, you know, idiosyncrasies and um, what do you think might have been something that was... I'm going to make it to work. <laughs> I'm getting the tap on the shoulder like, are oh, you done yet? All right, we'll wrap this in five or ten minutes. Okay. Um, but yeah, like, you know, was it being too much of a control f person or well or, yeah i mean i what what's hard you know and i and i can relate having been you know people's boss before you know it's really hard when you're because he was super sensitive and but he you know was stoic about it and he but he wanted you to love him I mean, he really did, you know, and, it, and when you, when anybody would question anything, it was, you don't love me, you know, why are you asking about the money, why are you asking this, why are you, you know, it was a personal, like, it would hurt his feelings, so that was pretty bad. You can do that in a more clean way, you know, and not affect yeah. the people around you, you know. Yeah. What was um your your favorite um show ever? My favorite show. Is there one? Like where maybe it was the biggest crowd you guys ever did or or something? Um, well, I do remember, like, one of the most intense kind of crazy moments was when we played at the Superdome, and um, Prince had them turn the house lights on because he wanted to see the crowd. <laughs> and it was like 90,000 people, and they turned the house lights on in the stadium, and it was it was like, no, turn it on. <laughs> That was insane. Totally insane. And they, the screaming was so loud, our ears were distorting. It was just like, <sighs> couldn't hear anything. First part of the song, my like first song. It was, like, it was like the Beatles, like, I can't hear anything. It was pretty crazy. Wow. Yeah. 
was it was it kind of freaky during um the height of his popularity when like it was almost like a beatles kind of thing and people were freaking out yeah yeah it was incredible it's like what the hell's going on here we're the beatles like yeah even us like like i had a bodyguard like that cracks me up but <laughs> <laughs> but then i actually I needed one when you know walking just from the hotel to the bus or something there were crowds of people and it was it was really a strange you know a strange feeling oh i so much appreciate um the time that you've given me and also the truth and rhythm viewers and listeners um is there any Final thought that we haven't like talked about that maybe you just want to quickly express or or get a message out to the fans or anything like that. Um, not really. Just it's just really. It's great that there's such a community, you know, around him and what he did and, and what we did, and I'm proud to be a part of it. And um, thank you for asking me to be on your show. And um, it's great that you have like your fans and you're doing this, doing your thing. And I, I've watched your show a couple of times and <laughs> you have cool people on it. So I was glad to be one of them. You definitely are. You definitely are one of them. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> one of the cool ones, I mean. Uh, is what's the uh, best way for people to keep up with, you know, what you guys are doing and the latest, both from a Wendy and Lisa and a revolution standpoint? Um, well, Twitter and Instagram or we're, we got Wendy and Lisa and the revolution on Twitter and on Instagram and, and Wendy and Lisa.com. We're always doing stuff. So you can look for us there. Well, thank you so much for all the great music you've given us and for continuing to keep that legacy alive of, of Prince and the revolution. And it means so much to so many people. So on behalf of all of them, I'm saying thank you. Thank you. Thank you back to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Scott. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> all right. Take care. Bye. Bye, Scott. Tell Wendy thank you, too. Oh, yeah, I will. She's okay. a trooper. <laughs> bye. Okay, bye. Well, that was quite a ride and a lot of fun, wasn't it? I sure enjoy conversing with her. With that, it's time to wrap up this edition of Truth and Rhythm. A huge thanks to my special guests, Ms. Lisa Coleman, indispensable member of the revolution and glorious keyboard contributor to Prince's stunning 1980 to 1986 era that included his rise to superstardom and being acknowledged as one of the greatest musicians of all time. And let us not forget the solid body of work she and Wendy Melvin have gone on to produce. If you've not checked it out, I urge you to do so. Also, special thanks to you, the viewer and supporter of this program. Subscribe, if you haven't already done so, subscribe to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives and breathes. And, you know, we need that support. Tell friends, tell family, bring it on. We need the masses showing how important this funk, R&B, soul, and jazz music is, as well as the artists that created it. Be sure to look out for upcoming Truth and Rhythm episodes and catch up with previous installments at funkystuff.net, on YouTube, and through iTunes and other leading podcast providers. Also, I want to hear from you, so write me. Email scottg at funkystuff.net. Let me know what you like about the program, who else you want to see. If you're an artist yourself, write me and let's see if we can get you on this show. Um, just to talk music, drop me a line. I will respond. I promise you that. With that, as always, this is Scott Dr. Jake Skullfine signing off saying, keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one.